Hi guys, uh, I'm Sumner and this is Sumner and today we're going to be talking about something that we're all going through at the moment, which is stress. So, stress in the short term, we all know, it increases norepinephrine and epinephrine and helps make energy available uh, to run, to, to get away from whatever the stressor is. Um, but what does it do exactly in the long term? Well, in the long term, there's a, there's a few ways that we can test this scientifically. There is, you know, the tail flick test. We have the tail on a heat pad, and once the heat pad gets um, really warm or warm to the point where it's painful, the rat will flick the tail. Um, there is, you know, predatory orders that you can put with the rat. You can do forced swim tests where the rat just sits in a water uh, chamber that it can't get out, so it either has to swim or just um, float there. There is chronic restraint stress where you put them in a tube and just like make them stay still. And then there's unpredictable um, chronic stress. And the reason unpredictable chronic stress is so important is that with you know the four swim tests, the chronic restraint test, if you're doing this on a scientific uh, schedule, then the animal can predict the stress. And being able to predict the stress kind of uh, inhibits or ameliorates a lot of the effects that we're looking for. And all these tests, of course, are context dependent. So what happens in the long term, or at least with our chronic stress, is that we see a decreased response to luteinizing hormone, a delay in the testosterone spike. If a, a female rat is pregnant with um, a male mouse, that testosterone spike is shifted. Look at hypertension as you age. If you say you have high stress versus low stress, there's kind of like this synergistic curve um, and an increase in hypertension levels. Look at monkeys. Monkeys have a hierarchical society from alpha male, beta males, gamma males, and so on and so forth. And if you're at the very, very bottom of that, uh, if you look at what happens to their insides over time, they have an increase in ulcers, they have uh, cardiovascular damage. They not only have cardiovascular damage, but it's also, um, they're, they're isolated, they're bullied by the other monkeys, and they have a decreased uh, memory or memory capacity. How is stress actually working? Well, stress works via the HPA axis, or the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, and the HPA axis increases norepinephrine and epinephrine uh, in the frontal lobe, the amygdala, the locus cerealis, and the periocleductal gray, but not only does it do that, it's actually a very long pathway of what happens. Stress first gets sensed by the periventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus. This triggers the release of cortical releasing hormone. And this then goes to the pituitary gland, which stimulates the release of adrenocorticotropic releasing hormone, which goes throughout the blood and through the, your adrenal glands down in your body, and stimulates the release of glucocorticoids, which then go back into the blood and through your body and up to your brain. So once in your brain, what do these glucocorticoids do? Well, there are two receptors that help kind of mediate their effects. You have mineralotropic and glucocorticoid receptors. The mineralotropic receptors bind to glucocorticoids with a very, very high affinity, and then they saturate at very low levels of glucocorticoids. So this helps establish your baseline, and it's also very circadian rhythm dependent. It's also found throughout regions of the brain, like the cortex and limbic system. Your glucocorticoid receptors, on the other hand, bind to glucocorticoids for low affinity, unless they're synthetic, in which case, then it's a very high affinity. And the thing about the low affinity glucocorticoid receptor means they only saturate under high periods of your circadian rhythm or during a stress. And the thing about the glucocorticoid receptors is that they're located uh, in regions like the brain, like the hypothalamus, the hippocampus, and then lower brainstem regions involved in arousal and whatnot. You have a 10 times greater density of your glucocorticoid receptors than your mineralotropic receptors. And the thing is, when you have so much glucocorticoids, what ends up happening is that the response of those receptors uh, desensitizes. They, they, it's not as responsive. And because you have the high affinity receptor with the mineralotropic receptors uh, establishing baseline, and then your low affinity receptor with the glucocorticoids, you have this nice little balancing act that helps prevent you from overstimulating yourself or stressing yourself out to the point of death. All right, so then in the short term, glucocorticoids increase calcium-mediated neurotransmitter release in the hippocampus. So this is beneficial. It increases activity. And if you just inject glucocorticoids, you see fear-like behavior, more avoidance of open spaces and things like the open field test. However, in the long term, we see some very detrimental effects. Um, there's neuronal restructuring. There's a decrease in the dendritic tree as well as the volume of the neurons. There's a decrease in neurogenesis. Uh, there is increased of abnormal cell proliferation, which then results in apoptosis of all of those cells. 
In chronic restraint stress, we see increases in COX, IL, so interleukin 1 beta, INOS, and TNF alpha, which causes oxidative stress and inflammation, which we saw in uh, the OS and inflammation video in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Um, it also causes exocyticity, which results in decreases of available energy from the energy stores uh, and a decrease in neurotransmitter because you're using them all. And then you have to make more neurotransmitter, which further augments this um, energy deficit. Other toxicity is also behind the Tweed hypothesis. If you have glucocorticoids and you add a second stress like kinate acid or aging, there's often decreases in volume in the hippocampus, particularly the CA1 pure uh, pyramidal neurons. Also, you look at disease like Cushing syndromes, um, where people have unnaturally low levels of glucocorticoids, they take synthetic glucocorticoids. And the result is that um, there's volume loss. And the thing is, this volume will recover if you give, stop taking the synthetic glucocorticoids, which suggests that glia are also affected. In the long term, stress and glucocorticoids cause a lot of dysfunction. There's calcium regulation that's disturbed. There's a decrease in vascular efficiency. There's a decrease in glucose utilization. There's also a decrease in acetylcholine, which is the main electrical facilitator of activity in the hippocampus. Um, and so collectively, this results in a decreased threshold for excitatory uh, postsynaptic um, potentials, but also um, a decreased response to those EPSPs, which just results in this really abnormal cell um, cellular dysfunction, and it's a bad environment. Not to mention, high stress is associated with a lot of nasty things. If people are tortured, um, uh, not due to science, but you know, just due to unfortunate circumstances. Um, they have decreased volume in the cortex and hippocampus. And even if this, uh, or even if the stress is just something like chronic back pain, you see an average of 1.3 centimeters cubed um, volume loss in the cerebral cortex per year. Chronic restraint stress has been shown to increase backs, which is an apoptotic factor. And then in the elderly, we see increases in uh, stress is related to increases in cognitive decline. So we can see how stress can be a trigger for this neurodegeneration. So before we begin talking about how to cope with stress, let's talk about what stress can do for you. So early life stress. The stress is prenatal, so like um, a female rat that's stressed during the third trimester, we see uh, decreases in uh, neurogenesis, increases or just alterations in the volume of the amygdala, as well as a shift in the testosterone spike. But what if the stress is like maternal deprivation? Well, in rat pups, 15 minutes of maternal deprivation results in increases in CRH. Also, if rat pups are separated for three hours a day from days two to 14, and then put in a stressor like a forced swim test, we see decreases in neurotrophins, decreases in antioxidants, increases in glucocorticoids, as well as increase in depressive-like behavior. Now remember from the depression video, the forced swim test isn't the best for um, determining depression-like behavior. This depression-like behavior may actually be adaptive. If you look at primates, Harlow's experiment is an example of maternal deprivation. Uh, not only are the offspring of this experiment antisocial, but they're abusive to their own offspring. And what about adoptive moms? Um, primates that have an adoptive mother, they have less mutual glaze when the mom looks in the baby and the baby looks back, and they have less lip smacking, which is like mimicry of the mouth. And the result of this is that they've underdeveloped mirror neuron systems and emotional systems. Well then, what about being peer raised if you're raised with your peers? Well, peer raised animals had decreases in serotonin receptor densities and affinities, as well as an increase in the serotonin transporter and the dorsal medial frontal cortex. These changes were not only like long, but you know, they lead to a vulnerability of affective disorders because we see from all the previous videos that serotonin can mediate or play a role in a lot of these things. So collectively, there are these subtle changes that lead to drastic lifelong results. The effects of maternal deprivation include glucocorticoids that desensitize the systems, resulting in a loss of function. Because recall, the glucocorticoids are, in the short term, at least driving or facilitating um, you know, things like memory and things like uh, energy expediture. And this, these deprived animals, uh, animals that are maternally deprived, um, have decreases in their academic, social, and age-related learning as well as just greater cognitive decline as they age. But that's just the mom. How about the dad? Maybe Pop can do something for you. Animals are animal species that have active fathers like Odengus and um, prairie voles. 
um, their offspring do better in maze tests if they're raised with their father than if they are paternally deprived. Paternal deprivation is a mild stressor, and paternally deprived animals have increases in, in calbindin, which is a marker for GABA, in the medial prefrontal cortex as well as the VL and the VO. Have decreases in calbindin in the hippocampus. This effect is lost around three months, which suggests it's just temporary. The animals also have increases in CRH neuron densities in the orbital frontal cortex, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. So paternal deprivation is causing some changes, it's just not as drastic as maternal deprivation. But these are all in animal studies, you know, we're not too interested in animals, I mean, well, we are, they teach us a lot, but, but we're humans, so what about us? Unfortunately, maternal deprivation has happened in a large scale, such as in Romania. Uh, there were so many orphans that they were barely touched or fed. Their average IQ was around 63, and if they were adopted before 6 months of age, then you saw their IQ increase to around up to at least 107. If they were adopted after 6 months, though, their IQ went either down to 45 and up to, at best, 90. These children did not form pair bonds well with their new families, and they tended to be very antisocial, even homicidal by ages 8 or age 9. This is also something seen in like Russian orphanages. Um, since they cannot be adopted out of the country until after like three years of being in an orphanage, um, they tend to have these similar antisocial issues, such that 85% of them, or at least in America right now, are currently in the process mm -hmm. of being sent back. And while this sucks, um, in humans at least, it seems it's not so important for your mom to be biological. There is a critical window, and as long as you have a loving mother during that time, related to you or not, um, it does prevent a lot of these detrimental effects. There's also some other great early life uh, stress work. So if you recall from the depression video, we talked about CAPSI. Well, CAPSI demonstrated that early life stress or maltreatment tended to be, a, these individuals tended to be a lot more aggressive than those without, an effect that is augmented by low levels of MAOA, which again is indicative of serotonin levels. So clearly, early life stress is causing massive epigenetic changes to the HPA axis and other systems in the brain. So, how do we ameliorate these effects or cope? Well, let's just start by saying the effects that happen with stress, and early life stress in particular, are adaptive. Well, adaptive to those high stress situations. Rats that have been maternally deprived freeze 75% of the time compared to 45% to conditioned fear. Freezing behavior is really advantageous for these animals, it helps them not get spotted by felines. And although, as these rats age, they have decreased neurogenesis and neurons in the dentate gyrus, and thus lower spatial memory, under stressful conditions, they had increased long-term potentiation, or learning. Okay, so now to coping. Well, if we look at learned helplessness, so, you know, when you shock an animal and you give it nowhere to go, and then you add a barrier after it's learned that it can't do anything about the shocking, um, then the animals don't leave. But it's often forgotten, though, is that 50% of them stayed. The other 50% hightailed it out of there. And this suggests there's two types of coping mechanisms, active and passive. Vice ran an experiment where rats were shocked and then either put into a cage in isolation or with a house made or a piece of wood. Some of the rats with something in their cage tended to bite that thing. And if we look at those rats with this uh, post-mortem after they had this kind of passive aggressiveness, they had decreased ulcers compared to those in isolation. So there is a disposition to this more aggressive coping strategy. Um, those who are more aggressive tend to have higher sympathetic nervous system arousal, but lower glucocorticoids. Likewise, cognitive reappraisal is also a successful coping technique, but those who are better at it tend to be better at regulating their emotions, which suggests a serotonergic component. Not to mention that if you think of depressed people, they have altered serotonin systems and they seem to be very bad at this. All they can focus on is the negative and they can't really reappraise their situation to see it otherwise. More evidence for a serotonin component comes from pacing. Pacing is a rhythmic activity that increases theta waves, which then increases serotonin. Animals in a pacing or animals that pace in captivity have decreased glucocorticoids and sympathetic nervous system activation. There are other coping strategies as well besides purely active and passive. Um, just having perceived control over the stress helps a lot. So if you take a rat and shock them on a regular schedule, but there's a light that indicates when the shock is coming, you see that these rats adapt to the stress. They don't lose their body weight, they even sleep between shocks, even as regular five minutes. However, if you remove that signal, you lose this effect, um, which suggests that anticipation is cr critical. It's this uh, placebo effect, which we talked about in substance abuse, 
And then there's affiliative social support. So if you take a mouse out of its cage and you hold it or you stroke it, the one that's stroked has decreased heart rate and blood pressure, which is mediated via oxytocin. Similarly, you can look at pair bonding. In prairie voles, when they find their larf mate, they have this decreased basal glucocorticoids as well as a decreased glucocorticoid response to a stressor. In deer mice, in an unpredictable chronic stress paradigm, if they were pure raised, they have less HPA activation than those that were raised alone. And in a male mouse, which, which had induced stroke, if it's housed with just a female, then you have decreased resulting damage, which is really fascinating. And then something that's totally interesting is that MPY has been implemented in coping. MPY is increased in flexible copers, or people who can oscillate between positive and negative symptoms. Uh, bleh, not symptoms, what am I talking about? This, this isn't schizophrenia, that was yesterday. Um, positive and negative, uh, positive and positive and negative coping strategies. It also increases with stress and aids in fat deposition. So what is interesting is that if you look in veterans, either those with no combat experiment, combat experience or combat experience that develop PTSD, those without PTSD had the highest rate of NPY, where those um, with had much lower. What's even more fascinating is that those of no PTSD group, um, half of those actually already had PTSD and they successfully recovered before ever being entered into the study. So how might MPY be doing this? Well, it co-localizes with GABA in the amygdala, and when you inject MPY into the amygdala, you see a decrease in anxiety behavior. Also, in rats with acute stress, it increases that memory retention. If you inject MPY, you see a decrease in the memory retention. So this suggested MPY may be aiding in resiliency as well as emotional salience of events, perhaps even weakening these memories as they are getting encoded. Now, all this talk about stress, let's talk about PTSD or post-traumatic stress syndrome. Well, is PTSD actually a stress disorder? Well, let's start with yes. Sure. They have an increased arousal or startle response, which is driven by increased glucocorticoids and sympathetic nervous system activation, which decreases their concentration and may be a part of their insomnia. There are also genetic components like genes related to CRH and glucocorticoid receptors. And then there are personality traits like aggression that are correlated with PTSD. Perhaps as Capsi showed, because aggression is associated with these serotonin changes. Actually, in 2004, uh, when there were all those hurricanes in Florida, if you look at people with the greatest risk for PTSD, so individuals with high exposure and low social support, 70% of those who developed PTSD had the short allele for serotonin transporters. Then there is increased activation in the amygdala to both positive and negative stimuli, and volume loss in the medial prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for interpreting these signals, which may result in then just everything being a stressor because the MPFC isn't working. Also, PTSD does look a lot like oppression. There's volume loss in the medial and anterior cingulate cortex, as well as the medial, dorsal lateral, and orbital frontal cortex. There may be loss in the hippocampus, but if there is loss, it's in the CA3 fields, which get input from the entorenal cortex and cortex. This may result in abnormal recall. So for example, if there was a trauma and people did or did not develop PTSD, those who did have decreased activity in the thalamus, ACC, and MPFC during recall. Also, the CA3 field gets inputs from the temporal lobe, which is responsible for subjective sense of well-being. This may explain that numbing sensation that is so often uh, that so often accompanies PTSD. The CA3 volume loss may also be explained by insomnia because if you restore sleep, you restore some of that volume, which suggests that the glia are the ones that are being affected. All of this volume loss is greater and more stable in youth, which is correlated with verbal ability. Okay, so how about PTSD not being a stress disorder? Well, people with PTSD have lower cortisol levels, either because it was slow to begin with or glucocorticoids just desensitize the system, although their SNS is still active. Likewise, in anxiety disorders, if in response to stressor, there is an SNS spike, but no glucocorticoids, meaning that there isn't any feedback from the glucocorticoid system to tamp down the sympathetic nervous system. So is PTSD purely stress-based? Well, there are several theories behind PTSD. There's either a problem in recovering from the trauma or a dysfunction in encoding, or both. For the encoding dysfunction, this kind of makes sense. They have this greater norepinephrine levels helping cement the event in their minds. Also, if we look at the role of endocannabinoids in normal individuals, they are released during salient events and may help interfere with long-term memories, binding to the receptors in both the amygdala and hippocampus. And when PTSD patients recall events under the THC, their PTSD scores go up, meaning they get better. So perhaps PTSD individuals, this is an internal endocannabinoid issue.
All right, so now let's talk about achievements. Well, first, back it up, let's talk about protection. So in rich environment and exercise, before or after stress, is protective against anxiety behaviors. Yeah, exercise, it solves most things, if you haven't gathered that by now. Not treatments. Well, exposure therapy, cognitive behavior therapy, and controlled breathing helps extinguish the fear response. And EMRD, um, or like this ap rapid eye movement that you do when recalling the memory, um, may increase theta waves, and that may be beneficial. Benzodiazepine has also been used, as well as TCAs and SSRIs. Actually, in the Davidson study, Zoloft, which was shown to lessen the severity of PTSD, also facilitated cognitive behavioral therapy. However, if you stop the meds, there is relapse, and there is never 100% recovery, even if you're on the meds from the beginning. So now we need to look at other kinds of drugs, drugs that actually help treat the disorder. How about hallucinogens? Well, psilocybin, which acts on the 5-HT1A receptor compared to methamphetamine, increases scores on all measures of PTSD for 14 months. And that was only just two doses. Likewise, ecstasy acts on the sympathetic nervous system, the HPA axis, and the serotonergic system, and yields beneficial results. It suggests that a mild agonist, which uh, may help cognitive reappraisal. So recall d from the OCD video, how it helped with obsessions, it may help get the mind unstuck here. Also, these drugs increase oxytocin, which helps facilitate pair bonding, perhaps even with their therapist. And recall from coping how oxytocin is really effective. However, these drugs are Schedule 1, and rapid or mass use results in death of serotonergic neurons, and a mass spectrometry over three years indicate that the drugs like ecstasy are increasingly contaminated with methamphetamine and vary in the actual doses of uh, MDMA. Yet both these drugs facilitate cognitive behavioral therapy, barely act on the dopaminergic pathway, and help restore the imbalance of serotonin and the dopamine. Interesting, actually, is the synthetic versions of these drugs, or uh, variations of them like Delta-11 versus Delta-12, seem to even be more potent. Lastly, if you're worried about these folks that are going to start abusing drugs, uh, these drugs, especially since they're so illegal, well, many individuals with PTSD already do abuse drugs, like alcohol, and when their symptoms decrease, so does the abuse. Okay, another long video, so let's recap. We started talking about stress in the long term, particularly glucocorticoids and their effects. And then we discussed early life stress and the epigenetic changes that take place which lead to antisocial behavior and emotional disturbances. We then followed and talked about coping strategies of stress and finished with PTSD. PTSD, as we discussed, may not be a true stress disorder, and these illegal drugs like psilocybin and ecstasy may need to be reconsidered for therapeutic use. And that is something about a neuron. Alright, as with the last video, comment about magic mushrooms, something stressful that happened to you, and coping strategies. Like, subscribe, and share, and enter to win a free neuron. And I'll see you all tomorrow.